Good morning. Wow, sorry. That scared me. Anyway, let's try to get settled. We're going to start the, start the program here in a minute. So uh, on behalf of the Strauss Center, the Clements Center, and our co-sponsors, the LBJ School of Public Affairs, I'd like to welcome everybody to the Intelligence Studies Project's fifth annual symposium. I, I must confess for myself and for the, for the team that these five years have passed incredibly quickly. I'm exceptionally grateful for the support provided to the ISP by the university's leaders, our ever-eager students, and members of the diverse national security community here in Central Texas. There are a great many people who deserve specific thanks for the ISP's five years of growth and for today's event. So the staffs of the Strauss Center and the Clements Center always do an absolutely terrific job, but this year they were presented with an acute challenge because the ISP's team has been shorthanded for several months and they had to step in. So before we uh, get further into the day, I'd like everybody to take an opportunity to thank our staffs who put on this terrific event. I'll also single out uh, Admiral Bob Inman against his wishes, uh, who's sitting down below. He's going to be introducing our keynote speaker later today. Admiral Inman is, of course, uh, an icon of U.S. intelligence. And he's the principal reason the University of Texas has grown into a national leader on teaching, research, and public engagement on national security and intelligence matters. He hosted our out-of-town guests last night for a lovely uh, welcome dinner. And as many of you know, Admiral Inman has also generously lent his name to the chair in intelligence studies that ensures the sustainability of our academic programs. Finally, we owe a particular debt to the many national security scholars and government officials who accept our invitations to travel to Austin, engage with our students. We have another distinguished group of experts on hand today, including many repeat visitors vying for that coveted designation as friends of the project. We know how busy you all are, and we're grateful that you agreed to spend the day with us. And since all of us have served previously in government, we understand how difficult it is for incumbent office holders to escape the vortex created by the Capitol Beltway. So let me offer special thanks to Assistant Attorney General John Demers, National Intelligence Council Chair Amy McAuliffe, just behind here, uh, and also Deputy Director of National Intelligence Sue Gordon. Uh, Sue's up having breakfast with some students at the LBJ School, and she's going to join us later this morning. So briefly about the program, you know each year the ISP concentrates on upgrading one component of what we do. And over the past year we focused on adding talent to our teaching roster and offering a wider variety of intelligence related courses to UT's students. In addition to my longstanding colleague Paul Pope, our postdoctoral fellow Kirill Avramov and CIA's resident intelligence officer Alan Kessler are teaching undergraduates and graduate students here at UT this year. This has allowed us to supplement our basic intelligence and national security courses with courses on strategic communications, counterterrorism policy, th thinking, writing, and briefing for intelligence, as well as Russian active measures. We also recently announced that our good friends Nick Rasmussen and Michelle Malvesti have joined the Strauss Clemens team as non-resident fellows. Nick's sitting just back here if you don't know him yet. Michelle's a former NSC counterterrorism official, and she's already led a course at the LBJ School on Women in National Security. Nick, who many of you know is the last director of the National Counterterrorism Center, uh, will be offering a course here in Austin in the fall, and we look forward to that. So while we've focused on our teaching mission, the ISP has also piloted in the last year the Texas Intelligence Academy. Last spring in Washington, D.C., a cohort of undergraduates drawn from across the UT system spent 10 days meeting with intelligence community leaders, senior practitioners, they visited agency facilities, and learned in practice how every day intelligence supports the policymaking process. A larger cohort of UT students are going to be gathering in Washington in late May for the second annual running of the Texas Intelligence Academy. Next up on the ISP's research docket, we're going to be analyzing and posting the results of a second round of nationwide polling that gauges public perceptions of U.S. intelligence. Our original aim for this poll was to establish a baseline against which we could measure changes in the public's view of intelligence 
attributed to the IC's transparency initiative. Many of you will recall that uh, the last DNI, Jim Clapper, introduced this initiative, and it's still in effect. And the aim of it is to make the IC's work and contributions to our national security more accessible and understandable to the American people. I must say, regrettably, one new purpose for this polling data is to measure any impact on the public's perception of the IC that may be potentially attributable to the president's public criticisms of the competence, objectivity, and past leadership of American intelligence. I can report that at least for uh, the polling that we conducted over the last 12 months, public confidence in the intelligence community remains quite high, and that applies across all demographic groups. So before we launch, <laughs> before we launch the first panel, I'd like to take a moment to place today's discussions into a broader, possibly even a coherent uh, context. The theme we selected for this year's symposium is intelligence and transition, right? And so our thesis is that this is a unique and a consequential moment for U.S. intelligence, and therefore for, for, for America's national security. The 9-11 terror attacks took place more than 17 years ago. This means that a generation of US off intelligence officers has known only a community of agencies singularly focused on preventing a follow-on terror attack against our homeland and also supporting deployed American forces in the Middle East and South Asia. And while the threat of religiously inspired violence is by no means extinguished, there is a growing sense that counterterrorism is an inadequate organizing principle for the national security challenges that lie ahead. Recent strategy documents produced by the White House, the Defense Department, and the Office of Director of National Intelligence all describe in differing degrees of generality a shifting national security environment. This trend was explored last fall here in this very room during UT's National Security Forum that was entitled a return to great power competition. So the good news, America has an enormously capable intelligence community. The 17 IC agencies are full of talented people. Our technology is cutting edge and the funding levels over the last decade and a half have been consistent and generous by any standard. The days, months, and years after September 11 also revealed an IC that was quite adaptable and innovative. In his recent worldwide threat testimony, the DNI identified a daunting list of potential hazards to America's security and our prosperity. Notwithstanding these capabilities, the IC cannot collect and evaluate against the, all of these objectives with equal effectiveness. The question, therefore, is whether this is the right time to insist on unambiguous, transparent, and accountable choices by the leaders of our intelligence community and the policymakers they serve. And if this is the right time, does the IC have the institutional capacity and confidence to debate and defend judgments about a highly uncertain future? So here I need to add a, a short teaching point for our students, otherwise I'll wreak havoc in Professor Pope's midterm exam, right? So in our courses, we always stress that one of the unique features of US intelligence is that its targets and priorities are determined by policymakers and not by the intelligence professionals themselves. That would be an illustration of the advanced bureaucratic concept known as the self-licking ice cream cone, right? <laughs> so the onus, therefore, would ordinarily fall on US political leaders to steer the IC towards its particular interests and concerns. This is not, however, particularly reassuring given the prospect of the current administration's propensity for short-term and erratic decision-making. So I would offer that while policymakers would normally assign intelligence priorities, in a case where they're warning against strategic threats that are well beyond the politician's horizon, the IC should be prepared to initiate this process itself and shift focus towards more pressing dangers. Unfortunately, there's very little in America's short history with intelligence that would indicate we can or will voluntarily make such hard choices absent the urgency of wartime. In 1947, the memory of an intelligence failure at Pearl Harbor and the specter of global competition with the Soviet Union shaped the modern intelligence community and gave it purpose. 
That arrangement served well until the USSR's collapse in 1991. But in the relatively peaceful decade that followed, the IC became a source of fiscal savings rather than a source of unique insights into emerging national security threats. But in an instant, on September 11, 2001, US intelligence had a new purpose and a new organizing principle. Will this be the first time in our history that US intelligence voluntarily reorganizes itself in peacetime to address emerging strategic threats? We've challenged our guests today to weigh in on this thesis. Is US intelligence, in fact, at a pivot point? And if so, in what direction should it be pivoting? And how should that choice be made? Finally, we'll ask whether we have the right structures, processes, people, and tools to confront threats that appear to be changing even before they've fully emerged into view. And so with that, I'm going to call on some of my friends and colleagues, Ambassador, Professor, Dean, uh, Bob Hutchings, Chairman, I should add, former Chairman of the National Intelligence Council, Amy McAuliffe, and others on the panel. Uh, we've asked them to discuss the role played in strategic warning by the National Intelligence Council, both historically and currently. So Bob, Amy, Philip, rest of the group. While Bob's getting settled and the group's coming up here, I want to remind everybody that uh, today's discussions are all on the record. The events are being live streamed on UT's site and will ultimately be available on the ISP, Strauss, and Clements websites. We're going to take a short break immediately after this upcoming session, and we'll appreciate everybody's cooperation throughout the day as we attempt to stick to our posted schedule. So thanks very much for coming out.